Thanks. Let me just share screen again and see if I can actually get the right one up. Do you see the agenda there? Yes, you're you're on the right path. Okay, thanks, Katie. So you should, should see an agenda. So thanks very much. Um, nothing like technology to really get your day started. So uh, today, my time with you, before you hear from Faye, I'm just going to uh, give you a bit of an update. It, it sort of feels a little bit like we just spoke at the Vault Plenary, but of course, much has really happened in the last six months. I'm going to start by sharing a bit of an operational update with you, and then I'm going to speak to some of the key policy work that's underway at the Law Society right now. And of course, uh, I'll end my time with you by sharing a bit of licensee resource information, and then I'll turn it over to Faye from the Discrimination and Harassment Council program to spend some time with you speaking about our DHC program, which is so important. Uh, so let me get started by uh, talking to you a little bit about our pandemic response and our working forward protocol at the Law Society. So when I was here last fall, I shared an overview of some of the various pandemic supports that were available to licensees. And at this time, uh, we're hopeful, like so many other organizations, that the Law Society would be moving from our pandemic response into our new distributed workforce environment. Now, last fall, unfortunately, that was delayed. Uh, by necessary public health measures in place over the winter, but I am really pleased to let you know that on April 4th, the Law Society staff resumed all of their new work arrangements under our new distributed workforce model. And that model is really just a long-term sustainable plan that focuses on more responsive work arrangements for all of our team members, whether they're on-site, remote, or hybrid. After about two years of working under a pandemic response, this model provides much needed flexibility, balance and wellness for our employees in a way that really does allow us to implement new workflows and leverage technology and innovation so that we can optimize our productivity. I certainly want to assure all of you at FOLA that whether our team is working on site or whether we're working remotely, we remain committed to assisting licensees and of course committed to uh, assisting the public with all of their needs as well. The public spaces in Osgoode Hall, the Great Library, uh, for instance, reopened to visitors on April 4th as well. Uh, if you are planning on visiting Osgoode Hall in the near future, I'd certainly encourage you to first read over the information on our COVID-19 response center so that you're aware of our current public health measures that are in place. They are changing as everyone moves forward. Um, and so that you'll know exactly how you can access the library and the courts if you're coming down to visit. And uh, everything you need is on our website on the COVID-19 response page as well. So don't hesitate to look at that and reach out to me if there's anything that you need to know. So uh, let's talk a little bit about licensing updates. As we adjust to our post-pandemic normal, we're really pleased to be proceeding with optional in-person call to the bar ceremonies this June in Toronto, London, and Ottawa. And we're also going to be hosting paralegal receptions in London and Ottawa. So after two years of disrupted work, uh, disrupted schooling, disrupted social and networking opportunities, I know that this is going to be a really welcome return to tradition for this new cohort of licensees and all of us at the Law Society and the greater legal community as well. Um, licensing exam updates. I'm sure that uh, you've all heard about this and I just wanted to provide a high level update on the changes to licensing examinations for the 2022-2023 licensing cycle. Um, in March, the Law Society canceled online examinations after we received information that strongly indicated that examination content had been improperly accessed through cheating. This was in contravention of the examination rules and protocol and compromised the integrity of the upcoming examination period. We moved immediately uh, with a comprehensive investigation of the matter by a team of external investigators. And last month, the external investigation team issued letters to individuals who may be involved in the cheating scenario, advising that they will be subject to investigation through the regulatory process as a result of conduct related to these licensing examinations. With the investigation underway, our focus turned to developing a plan that would allow candidates to proceed with licensing as quickly as possible in a process that would not be tainted by the possibility of cheating. In the current circumstances, that meant in-person delivery because it provides the necessary degree of security 
to ensure examination integrity and to also protect the reputation of all those candidates who were in no way implicated by this investigation. So in early April, new examinations were held for those that had been canceled. And we also announced in-person dates for summer examinations. We recognize, of course, the challenges that in-person examinations may cause for some candidates. And we are continuing to offer several supports to those candidates, including accommodations for those who required them based on a human rights ground, options to defer the examination, and we've also encouraged candidates in financial need to apply for our repayable allowance program. We've also reached out to articling principals, and so a shout out to all of you and to all of your members, uh, to discuss the unique challenges of rescheduling and those challenges, what those challenges may pose to the candidates, and to ask for everyone's compassion and flexibility when you're working with articling candidates, whose articles may be impacted as a result of these unfortunate circumstances and some date changes. We'll continue, of course, to support candidates and to keep you apprised on developments as we move ahead with regard to this particular cheating issue. Um, a little bit of a snapshot of the professions today. I always like to give you a bit of data. And uh, on the screen, you'll see a bit of statistical uh, figures that I think you might find some interest in as at the end of 2021, our membership now includes nearly 58,000 lawyers and close to 11,000 paralegals. And that's a growth of 13, over 13 and a half percent and over 15 and a half percent respectively through 2020 and 2021. So really tremendous growth in the professions. You'll find a complete breakdown of the Law Society's 2021 operations and financial statements in our 2021 annual report, which is actually now available online. And we had our AGM last night. I don't know if any of you may have attended, but uh, that was held last evening. Another interesting uh, note that I wanted to just bring to your attention, Metrolinx. The Ontario government's transportation agency, Metrolinx, has announced its plans for the Ontario line, which is a 15-stop subway line that is going to run from Exhibition Place through to downtown Toronto and over to the Ontario Science Centre. The Metrolinx plan includes construction of a new Osgood station, which is going to have a significant impact on the green space and the property of Osgood Hall because the subway station entrance, the keyhole, is planned for the southwest corner of our property. Osgood Hall, as you know, is the oldest continuously used industrial property in Toronto and as its stewards, the Law Society takes our responsibility to protect all of our buildings and our grounds very seriously. We've engaged with various levels of government and heritage organizations as this project moves forward in our efforts to best ensure the care and the preservation of this important landmark. Uh, more information about this project, if you're interested, can actually be found in the Metrolinx consultation process, and that's found on their site at metrolinx.com. And you can also find more information about the significance of Osgood Hall itself in a series of blogs posted on our Gazette. And we've also been sharing some historical drawings and photos across our social media platforms. You can see a couple of them here on the screen. And I encourage you to follow along. And again, we'll share more updates as we get more information as it moves forward. Um, let me just switch now to regular, regulatory burden re, uh, reduction initiatives. I wanted to recap a few of the burden reduction initiatives that were underway or planned at the Law Society. When I spoke to you last fall, I shared a few details of the 2022 budget and its prioritization of strategic activities that allowed us to modernize the systems and processes that support effective regulation of the legal professions. So we have now, as of March 31st, passed our second harmonized filing deadline since moving to a harmonized structure back in 2020. And we did that in a pandemic, which I thought was a pretty uh, uh, great opportunity, a challenge for us at the Law Society as a team, but a great accomplishment for sure. That means, uh, with regard to a harmonized date, that by March 31st, all licensees are now required to submit their annual report filing pay their annual fees, and also ensure that their 2021 CPD hours are being reported. Bringing these dates together is just one way that we're making it easier for our licensees to meet their regulatory responsibilities. No doubt uh, you noticed the changes to the annual report filing this year. I know I was certainly pleased when I completed my own filing. You'll have seen a reduction in questions for all licensees, a new logic flow, and an autofill technology. 
We heard from many of our licensees who really appreciated the streamlined process. It's just one example of how we're making important regulatory processes more efficient for all of our licensees and for ourselves at the Law Society so we can spend more quality time with our licensees and with members of the public. Innovate Forward. This is a new project at the Law Society, a rather immense one. Uh, we are beginning, uh, are just in the beginning stages of a multi-year business transformation project. And that's going to replace our current database software management systems with a new cloud-based mobile friendly system. Now, uh, this project is technology enabled for its most part, but it is fundamentally going to change the way that we approach our work that and will make it uh, more customer focused, more customer centric, and will also provide enhanced self-service options for our licensees, for our licensing candidates, and also for the public. Ultimately, uh, this initiative is going to make it easier for licensees to meet their regulatory obligations as well, for the public to be able to access the information they need from the Law Society, and also for em our employees to go about their day-to-day -day work of upholding the public interest more effectively and more efficiently on behalf of everyone. So we're in the very early stages of this project. Um, I expect I'll be speaking to you more as we move forward. It's a multi-year project and we're really looking forward to uh, changing up some of our legacy systems and moving on with our technology systems. Uh, let's switch to key policy initiatives today. Just a few items that I'd like to touch on. Uh, key policy initiatives, including things like the access to innovation process, the competence task force report, and also a little bit on lawyer experiential training program. So let's start with access to innovation. The Law Society, as you know, launched our access to innovation or ATI project in November of 2021. Under this five-year pilot program, ATI is going to allow approved providers of innovative technological legal services to serve consumers while complying with risk-based public protection requirements through our as, as a regulator. Research tells us, of course, and we all know this, that Canadians do not seek professional assistant, assistance for more than 80% of their legal issues. And those issues can have profound effects on a person's physical, mental, social, and financial well-being. By safely removing and adjusting regulatory barriers at the Law Society, the A2I project facilitates much needed access to justice and can help people in need access new and innovative kinds of legal services. The A2I team has begun reviewing several applications, so we're very pleased about that. If you're interested in learning more about it, please visit our dedicated website. Uh, but I know that you'll also be hearing more about this very important project from Will Morrison just after us. So I'm just going to leave it there and let him uh, tell you a little bit more about the details. I um, wanted to just touch on the competence task force, something to watch. Professional competence, as you know, is an integral part of the Law Society's mandate. Just as the law itself and the practice of law changes over time, we also must continue to support lawyers and paralegals as they strengthen their skills and their knowledge bases. As you know, in June of 2021, the Competence Task Force's report uh, called Renewing the Law Society's Continuing Competence Framework was released and a call for comment was launched. The call for comment remained open until the end of November. And since that time, we've been reviewing the feedback as we work towards ensuring a modern, effective and balanced regulatory framework that's both proportionate and also of assistance to lawyers and paralegals as they maintain competence and we make sure as a regulator that we are protecting the public. We're expecting the final report and recommendations from the Competence Task Force to come before convocation this month at the end of May. So if you'd like to take a look at that, make sure you check out our convocation page where we post the reports in advance. And then finally, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the Lawyer Experiential Training Program enhancements with regard to policy changes. Last month, as you may know, Convocation confirmed a policy of mandatory minimum compensation for articling and other experiential training program, uh, positions. The decision followed a very active debate and input from the profession with lots of feedback being received. By way of background, mandatory minimum compensation for articling and other experiential training positions was initi initially approved by Convocation in December of 2018 as part of a series of enhancements to the lawyer licensing process, but implementation was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
There was a subsequent report to convocation in November of 2021 which recommended that the Law Society adopt a best practices approach to compensation. That would have encouraged rather than required that all experiential training placements be paid a mandatory minimum compensation. At that time, Convocation or our board sought additional feedback on the matter and the item returned to Convocation for consideration at its April meeting with the benefit of all of that tremendous feedback. And I would just like to really uh, thank FOLA for its submissions on all of these uh, important matters. You did note the importance of our regional and sole and small firms in the ongoing training of our licensing candidates and the critical need to canvas your input and that of your FOLA members directly and to uh, avoid assumptions in that regard. So I thank you very much for your submissions. And we are working toward a May 2023 implementation date for the mandatory minimum compensation policy. And we'll keep you apprised and updated as we move ahead and further policy decisions are taken in order to complete this particular implementation. Um, just before I wrap up, I do want to share a few resources with you. Uh, just call your attention to them again. Uh, the first actually being the Law Society's website, lso.ca. There's a wealth of information on the Law Society site. Uh, we get approximately 50 million page views site-wide annually at the Law Society. The website is one of our primary vehicles that we have to connect with and serve the public, but it also, as you know, houses important information and resources for our licensees. So today I wanted to just highlight uh, two items for you, the convocation section of our website and also the Gazette section of our website. So uh, you'll find information about the meetings of convocation in the about section of the Law Society's website. Meeting agendas are posted in advance and they include all of our committee reports. Each meeting is webcast. Uh, the archive of the webcast is actually po posted on the website later as well in case you missed it. And there's also a summary of decisions that are also posted online if you're interested in looking at that. And then the Gazette, just a reminder that this is the Law Society's online digital publication and it's also available on our website. The Gazette is your go-to resource for updates on what's happening at the Law Society, particularly with regulatory policy changes. In addition to news articles, you'll also find a number of blogs that cover a wide range of topics from consultations through to policy activity, right through to historic tours of Osgood Hall if you're interested and a lot more. And it's also, of course, really where you'll find the licensee update, the emails that we send out on a regular basis. They're all archived here if you have missed any of those issues. Um, the Law Society also has a number of licensee resources to support lawyers and paralegals as they navigate their careers. And we really greatly appreciate the FOLA presidents bringing these to the attention of your membership so that they're reminded that this is available for everyone. Personal management guidelines provide strategies to recognize sources of stress and signs of mental illness, and they also provide supports and resources to manage personal well being in the legal profession. The coach and advisor network provides licensees with access to shorter term outcomes oriented relationships with coaches and advisors who are drawn from the professions. The practice management helpline is a confidential telephone service to help licensees with questions about the rules of professional conduct the paralegal rules of conduct and other professionalism and practice management tips. In 2021, the practice management helpline responded to more than 8,000 lawyer inquiries and more than 1,500 paralegal inquiries. It's a very busy place to go. In the equity support section, just a reminder that you will find a number of very important resources, including a guide for lawyers working with Indigenous peoples and links to the equity legal education series of events. The guide itself is in the process of being revised and we expect to release the updated version later this summer. And uh, also remember that the equity events that we offer are free of charge in order to promote awareness and education on the challenges faced by equality seeking communities as they relate to the law and the legal professions. Most of these events are also accredited for, accredited for EDI professionalism hours as well. So if you aren't able to watch the live webcast, also remember that all of the program recordings are available for you on our website. And finally, we do have our CPD offerings as well as our complimentary CPD offerings. Not to forget that we have that available for all of you and your members. 
So uh, our final topic for today um, is on discrimination and harassment and the council program that we have at the Law Society. That uh, concludes my work right now. So I'm gonna shortly turn it over to Faye for a uh, discussion about the DHC. Uh, if we have time at the end of Faye's remarks and I'm happy to take any questions on the stuff I just buzzed through very quickly and I know you'll have the PowerPoint presentation. So if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me later by email personally happy to answer them. If we don't have any time for questions later on, um, I'm sure that Katie or Doug will send anything along for you. I'm happy to get back. Um, let me just first unshare my screen so that I can see everybody. And then I'll just uh, briefly introduce Faye um, and the program itself. The Discrimination and Harassment Council program was actually established as a pilot program in 1999 stemming from a recommendation in the Law Society's Bicentennial Report calling for a safe counsel program for victims of harassment and discrimination by lawyers. The program became permanent in June of 2001, and then as of 2007, now also includes, includes paralegals. Since its inception, the DHC program has acted as an innovative service designed to prevent and respond to human rights-based discrimination and harassment by Ontario lawyers, paralegals and licensing candidates of the Law Society. We've been working with the DHC to ensure licensees, candidates and members of the public are aware of these very important services. And I'm very pleased that Faye was able to be here with us today to share with you her own experiences working with the DHC program and supporting those who may have experienced or witnessed discrimination or harassment. Uh, uh, Doug actually introduced you to Faye and her bio is posted on the FOLA website. She has tremendous experience and expertise as a human rights, labor and constitutional lawyer whose experience includes a wide range of systemic human rights issues. So we are very grateful that the DHC program and those who it serves benefit from Faye's dedication to these very important issues. So Faye, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. And uh, thanks uh, for inviting us to be here. I am gonna share my screen with you and um, let me just put this up for you now. Uh, while Diana has introduced me, there are actually three of us who are serving in the Office of Discrimination and Harassment Council. Um, in addition to me, Lai King Hong and uh, Natasha Prasad are, uh, are part of the program. They are also very senior uh, lawyers in the area of um, discrimination and human rights and uh, workplace issues. So between us, we bring quite a wealth of, uh, of knowledge and experience to the, um, to the program. We are also um, the first people serving in this role who are all uh, racialized people. And that's brought um, a new perspective to the work that we do and has enabled um, a broader kind of outreach into the legal professions. Um, so people contact us uh, either through uh, email or through phone or um, through, through Twitter with um, concerns that they may have. And let me just outline a bit of how the program works. Um, the role of the DHC is to support the Law Society's core regulatory function. Um, by supporting compliance with those rules that are specifically about lawyers' special obligations to ensure um, that the way that they, their workplaces operate and the way that they provide services are free of discrimination and harassment and the same parallel obligations under the, para, uh, the paralegal rules of conduct. So while we are funded by the Law Society, we operate at arm's length and there's no sharing of information back and forth except for um, st uh, anonymized statistical information that I'll talk about. The purpose of having the service is, as Diana said, to provide safe counsel for people who have experienced discrimination or harassment by licensees to come and get information about what their options are and uh, how, to, uh, how to deal with what they're experiencing. Um, in doing this, 
the work that we do supports the accountability of the legal professions as self-governing professions. It ensures that, um, that there is uh, uh, some public visibility to the accountability around these issues. And in having these communications with people who have experienced discrimination and harassment by licensees, it's an important service that helps restore trust in the legal profession. When um, people have experienced discrimination and harassment by those people who they go to um, for assistance, who have a fiduciary obligation to look after their interests, it has a really profound eroding of the trust in the legal system as a whole, not just with that individual lawyer, but it um, reinforces a sense that um, the legal profession and the legal system um, don't operate fairly. So in the work that we do, it, there is a really important restorative um, component of rebuilding trust in the profession. Um, what we do is we provide a range of uh, confidential services to, to people who contact us. People will come and um, explain uh, experiences that they've had with human rights code-based discrimination and harassment. And um, what they're looking for is, uh, is really individualized. We don't provide legal advice. We don't provide legal um, uh, representation or investigation services. We are an information and safe counsel service that helps people navigate their options. It can be quite bewildering um, to go into the, to the legal system and know how to respond to that kind of um, behavior. And people who have experienced it are, are uh, really quite traumatized. The services are available to anyone, right? Members of the public, um, people who are clients, uh, people who are working in legal workplaces, whether they're staff, students, um, associates, paralegals, trainees, partners. And we get contacts from all of them. Um, so we'll, uh, We'll hear what has happened to them. Uh, we'll ask them, what is it that their ideal um, outcome would be? Because as I said, people have very different um, notions of what will be a fair resolution for them. And then we talk about all the different uh, avenues that are available to them, depending on what kind of resolution they're looking for. And you know, the most obvious ones are, uh, the ability to file a complaint with the, the Law Society's Complaints and Compliance Office, um, to file a complaint with uh, the Human Rights Tribunal, but there's a, a vast range of other options um, based on what people are looking for, right? Um, whether it's uh, supports that are available uh, through their union, if they're unionized, through law, uh, their law schools, if they are uh, students, um, whether it supports around particular issues um, like gender-based violence or disability issues, um, whether it's the need to connect with different um, racialized communities within the legal profession and so on. So we will talk through with them what all those different options are. And in some very limited cases, we provide uh, um, mediation and conciliation services. We, uh, but in very narrow circumstances, because we don't have the resources to have that as, you know, a whole separate wing of our operations. The, um, uh, the other thing that we do is outreach to ensure that people have, know what their rights are, uh, have that proactive educational role about rights and, um, and obligations. And there are times where people approach us um, in anticipation that there might be issues and they want to know what they can do to head them off. And so we provide that coaching as well. Um, but it is an entirely neutral, nonpartisan um, service. The, uh, the other thing that we do, as I mentioned, is that we keep uh, anonymized statistics of the the number of concerns, the number of contacts, the range of issues that are raised by um, people who contact us. And we um, 
release these semi-annual reports, which are uh, posted on our website. Our website's in the process of being updated, but it does, um, it is a way of shining a light on what's happening and provide another uh, level or avenue for public accountability. Um, people often ask what, you know, who contacts us. Some things that are really significant um, are that there is regularly a very um, unbalanced representation by gender of who uh, seeks out our services. Overwhelmingly, um, when you're looking at members of the professions who contact us, it is overwhelmingly women and overwhelmingly uh, racialized women and uh, women with disabilities. For the men who contact us, it's almost exclusively racialized men or men with disabilities. So the burdens of um, discrimination and harassment we see falling very unevenly on the members of our professions. Um, and uh, what's also significant again, is that the people who are coming forward often are experiencing intersecting forms of discrimination, right? So combinations of race and sex, disability, religion, um, different um, overlapping systems of, um, of uh, marginalization. Those um, breakdowns are very are similar for clients and members of the public who uh, approach us as well. When we look at the grounds of discrimination and harassment that people are raising, um, sex and race are always the top two categories. Um, uh, sex has almost always been the uh, uh, highest um, or most frequent ground of discrimination, um, but race is also uh, increasingly um, becoming a, a significant one and disability is um, the third. I'm not sure why there's two categories for disability. I think those should be combined. So that should be a slightly taller um, uh, stack there. For the clients who um, approach us, disability is the number one um, concern and something that we flagged for um, a number of years now is that it points to a real need within the profession to um, build our capacity to understand how to work with clients with disabilities, ensure that our services truly are um, accessible. The, uh, you know, the things that we're facing are not unique to the profession in Ontario. Um, an international study was done of, um, uh, these kind of complaints across the globe. Canada was a very significant part of this study, but what we see is that um, bullying and discrimination are rife in legal workplaces around the globe. Um, you can see the figures here, one in two female respondents, one in three male respondents having experienced bullying. Sexual harassment is very common. One in three female respondents, one in 14 male respondents having been harassed at work. This is a focus on people in legal workplaces as opposed to clients. Um, but what we see also is that in most cases, uh, people do not report either bullying or sexual harassment. Um, and they don't because of uh, a sense of fear, the fear of repercussion, a fear of how it will harm their reputation, um, a fear that uh, it will, uh, there will be reprisals and it'll affect their career going forward. Um, but instead, what happens is that people leave, right? Um, the significant number of people who have experienced bullying and harassment or other kinds of discrimination leave their workplaces. And that's the case even in workplaces that have policies and training, right? Those policies and training may be there, but um, implementation may not be strong, or there's still a significant culture of fear. That's one thing that we see uniformly with the people who approach us, is that they are terrified of coming forward. There's a real culture of perfection and competition within um, the legals, the legal professions. And people are very worried that coming forward to raise any concerns 
is going to sabotage their careers, especially when um, they are beginning in the profession. Um, what we do when we uh, um, engage in outreach programs um, is try and focus on some problem solving strategies and, and break down where uh, there are broad areas to, to work to um, head off these concerns. Um, there are different client facing strategies that um, lawyers can build skills around um, to make the workplace uh, uh, more accessible for clients. There's also internal workplace management issues and also um, uh, an area to have an eye on is how advocacy is conducted before tribunals and in the broader community and whether the um, arguments and attitudes that are um, put forward in that context um, reinforce or break down stereotypes and prejudices. So that's the scope of what we're dealing with. I want to uh, reinforce that the kind of concerns that come forward are really quite serious, right? When we talk about um, sexual harassment or racial harassment in the workplace, um, it is verbal, it is um, physical, it is cyber stalking, it is, um, you know, these aren't minor complaints with the clients, it's really quite destabilizing. Um, and the power imbalance uh, between the people who are the targets and people who engage in the discriminatory behavior um, is always of significant concern, whether it's within the professions or between um, the professional and the client. So, um, you know, we continue to do the work, we continue to get um, contacts regularly, but I think it's important for us to be engaging in these kind of proactive um, uh, events so that people become more aware of the services and um, feel able to contact us. So um, if there is any support or um, uh, outreach that you would like us to do with your associations, we're very happy to do that.